Welcome to another Coffee with Samso, uh, where we speak with ASX companies and the guys who run these uh, companies uh, and listen to what their stories is all about. Uh, today we're at the uh, University Club here in Crawley on the campus of the University of Western Australia. And I've got Simon Mitchell here from Office Minerals Limited, who is at, at the moment uh, doing an IPO. And they are racing six million at 20 cents. That's right. Market cap of 11.1 million. And for all the brokers out there, an EV of 5.6 million. Um, it's all about uranium, uh, uranium in Australia, uranium in South Australia and Northern Territory. Northern Territory, yep. Uh, Simon, look, you know, we've had a long discussion about trying to get you in front of cameras for two, three years, and finally we, I have you. <laughs> um, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, tell us about, maybe give us an introduction to yourself and the company, and let's hear the rest. Give you the background. Okay, so I'm a geologist by background, uh, but I also did finance for a period of time. I worked in project finance in some of the banks. Uh, so I'm a bit of a mix of technical and financial skills. I did an applied finance degree, for example, uh, but I also did quite substantial field work as an exploration geologist and worked in a number of different localities around the world, including Bolivia, of all places. Right? Okay. So I've seen a few interesting bits of geology here you know, around various places around the world. Uh, love the industry. And uh, you know, I went into finance for a period, but I always wanted to go back into the corporate side of the exploration and mining industry. And uh, that's what I did. In fact, I had my first break on that when I worked as general manager for business development for Toro Energy. That was um, Greg Hall's Toro Energy back in around 2006 to about 2012, the last uranium boom. Yep. Uh, and I was doing a lot of M&A work back then, saw a lot of uranium deposits globally. Uh, so I, I have a very good assessment or a very, a very good understanding of uranium deposits globally for different deposit types, their economic potential, and, uh, and some of the technical issues that can come out of that. Okay, so, I mean, I'm a uranium bull. I think the time for uranium is coming. Yeah. Um, so, interestingly, uh, you know, uranium has always been sort of o overseas in Africa or Canada or in the Tarns. Um, what made you guys decide that this is the place to be? Apart from being it's yeah. everything else, right? Well, look, you know, it's probably not well recognised by a lot of people in Australia, but we're one of the bigger uranium producers globally. I mean, the biggest one, obviously, is Kazakhstan. But the number three and four position globally is usually between Canada and Australia. We sometimes swap positions on that one. Um, so we're both significant uranium producers in our own rights. So typically, you would have seen probably a few IPOs recently with Australian companies going over to the Athabasca Basin looking for high-grade uranium there. Nothing wrong with that model. Uh, it's, you know, that, that part of the world's got good form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Australia has also got two, two excellent areas where, which are recognised internationally, and particularly you know, with, within the uranium and nuclear power industry. It's the, uh, the Pine Creek origin in the northern part of the Northern Territory and the Froman Bayman in South Australia. You know, you've got hard rock mines over in, uh, in the Northern Territory, and then you've got the in-situ recovery mines in South Australia, both very well recognised internationally for their quality. And so yeah, that's where the we're one in South Australia is more sort of paleo channels. That's right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So that, that's, uh, you know, I guess where we're going are the, to those two addresses which are internationally well recognised. And let's be frank, Noel, there's also good politics in those two areas. So mm, mm. you can mine uranium in South Australia and the Northern Territory. Not something you can say about all Australian states at this point. Yeah. Okay. So that uh, makes sense, I guess. In so how does, I mean, Olympic Dam itself is a big uranium supplier. <clears throat> how, do they f how does that fit in with the other parts that you just mentioned? Yeah. <coughs> that, that produces a big chunk of Australia's uranium production. So, you know, when we, when we say we're number three or four in the world, Olympic Dam's got a lot to do with that, right? We also had the range of uranium mine not that long ago. It's obviously in, uh, closed down now, uh, but that was an important component of our, of our production as a country. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, at, at the end of the day, the whole Olympic Dam area 
uh, the Lipinic Dam mine is a bit of an outlier because there's a significant part of the world's resources there. Mm. Um, something like 30% of the world's uranium resources, I think, is in one deposit. I could be wrong on 30%, but it's, it's yeah. a big, big number. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a really, um, I think, you know, IOCGs are their own class, yep, right? Yep. And it's, it's a big call for a junior to say, well, we're, we're out there looking for IOCGs. Usually it's the big boys doing that sort of thing. Um, and it, it's not to say that you wouldn't, you know, what's the word, accept it if you were lucky enough to hit an yeah, IOCG yeah, that yeah. had high uranium. But our model at, at, at Orpheus is that we're really looking for either paleo channel uranium in South Australia, which is amenable to in-situ recovery, which is lower capex, good you know, ESG principles, yep. and low, low environmental impact, all those good things. And also in South Australia, it's in a part of South Australia where no tourists, it's desert country, great place for a uranium mine, right? So yep. that's why we're out there. And then in the Northern Territory, that's a different sort of kettle of fish. We're looking for high grade, larger deposits there. Something like like a Ranger or a yep. you know, or a Jabaluka or something like that. So we're not talking grades the same that they see in the Athabasca. You know, we're not we're not talking you know, a deposit with twenty or thirty percent grade, um, but you might be talking something that might be one or two percent, mm. right? and something that's still very reasonable on the international uh, stage. From from. My point of view, investor point of view, the layman's point of view, and we're looking into industry, and most people out there will be thinking, hey, look, you know, uranium is uh, on the up. Yeah. The next guy, I think, is that I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think is Boss Energy. And yes. That's where you guys are. Is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, one of our main projects, the, what we call the Frome Project, is sort of the next door neighbour of uh, the Honeymoon Deposit which is where the boss, boss are restarting that yep, mine. Yep. I think it shut down in 2016 when the uranium price was very low. Um, so they're in the middle. Of, they made their f um, decision to finance and, and restart the mine a few months ago. I believe they're expecting to have um, their first lot of new production at the end of next year, end of 2023. So that's not far away. Um, so they're our next door neighbour. And then to the north of us, um, we've also got Beverly and Four Mile. Yep. which is not, you know, Heathgate's operating uranium mines. So that's, you know, a fair way to the north, but it's, it's in the broader frame environment, which is where we're looking for this paleo channel uranium. So to give us an idea of, I mean, it's easy to say, you know, roll front, paleo channel. Yeah. Is, and, and it's, it's uh, for, for geologists and for those who are not familiar with that. Yeah. Can you give us a rundown of what we're actually really talking about geologically not to a professor, but to, you know, your layman yes. investor. Yeah, yeah. So if you can give us a narrative on that, would be good. Yeah, okay. Um, look, a way to think about it is that, you know, it, in a lot of mines around the world, whether, you know, it's gold or nickel or, you know, any other commodity, you know, it might be generated by, uh, say, some sort of fluid, which, which, which has got a higher concentration of that in the fluid, intrudes into a sequence of rocks, and the, the structural and geochemical environment means that it drops out at a particular location. But at the end of the day, you've got an introduction of a fluid and that fluid is high in that particular metal that you're interested in. And so that creates the gold mine or the nickel mine or whatever, so that's, it's in there. With paleo channel uranium or roll front or sandstone hosted, there's all different terms for it. It's a slightly different mechanism in the sense that you've got a source rock that may be 10, 15, 20 kilometers away and uh, oxygen, oxy, what they call oxygenated waters, which is you know, an oxidized fluid, basically rainwater is percolating through that uh, granitic source that's a long way away and then it's flowing like a river through a sedimentary sequence until it gets to a point where it's either structurally or geochemically um, precipitated out like it's like it interacts with the local conditions and once you say for example the oxi oxygenated waters hit a reducing fluid then the chemistry is such that the uranium will drop out at that point so it's traveled some distance mm -hmm. to get where it needs to be and then if you get just the right environment uh, the uranium can drop out in that environment usually a small part of the paleo channel so for example a paleo channel might be like a little snake Right? Mm -hmm. And it's not like uranium will occur at high grade all along the snake. 
generally what happens is at some point along that snake the chemistry's changed or there's a fault which is introducing say a, a gas from oil and gas deposits deeper in the basin and so the hydrogen sulfide is coming up and interacting with the fluid with the uranium and then that's just the right chemistry for it to, to, to drop out at that point. So you get sort of zones of the paleo channel which are more amenable to the to the precipitation of uranium and that's generally where these mines occur okay right not along the entire paleo channel yep, but yep. sometimes on a bend yep. you know or sometimes on a fault or sometimes where you've got large amounts of organic matter which yep. is producing just the right chemistry and do they occur in i don't know whether the cluster is the right word but do they seem to happen in the same place um, like a province or something like that. Yeah, that's right. So there are a number of reasons for that. So you might find a cluster of in situ recovery mines in a particular area. And it's because usually it's because people are exploring a larger basin area, right? So you've got uh, the basin will have the architecture which allows the uranium to be stripped from uraniferous granites off to the side of the basin coming into the basin over long periods of time. So a basin is basically a place where, you know, fluids are flowing over millions of years, right, as it's depositing. So you need a lot of geological time to kind of build up the situation. And so typically that's in a basin. Yeah. So in, in the case of South Australia, we have what's called the Froman Bayman. There's a large basin area there. And so you know, you've got Beverly four mile to the north and Honeymoon off to the east. These are all sort of part of a one big macro system. Now, they have different source rocks. So in Honeymoon's case, you've got uraniferous granites to the south, like the Crocker Well Suite. And then to the north with Beverly and Four Mile, you've got the Mount Painter Group, which is sort of off to the east of that area. So different source rocks, same mechanism going into the same basin. And it's always good to have a little bit of, little bit of oil and gas or something. It may not commercial quality oil and gas necessarily in the basin, but enough so that the chemistry is right. Okay. Yeah. And so you'll end up, take um, Kazakhstan, for example, right? So there's a whole series of in-situ mines which are following essentially the same trend of the margin of the big basin there, right? So the architecture's in place yep. for the, the precipitation of uranium in particular conditions, and it's found in a particular part of that basin. So we have a similar scenario in South Australia where we think we have all the right preconditions for a cluster to occur uh, in the same basin. Okay, okay. A, a, a bit like a mineral system. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, uh, the cooking pot, I used, yeah. used to use the word. Yeah, that's right. You, it ticks all the technical boxes. That's not to say that everyone's going to succeed and find something on their ground, yep. but you've got a good chance because you're in the right zone yep. Yep. and you're ticking all the right technical boxes as a precondition to be successful, in yep. a sense, right? Yep. That principle can also be applied to other basins um, that may be not as well recognised. So one of the things that we'll do as Orpheus is that we'll be looking at basins in other parts of South Australia and the Northern Territory, which may have been explored by the oil and gas guys, but have been less recognised in the metal industry for having potential uh, okay. for uranium. So these are, you're looking in other basins, right? For other, other zones where there might be uraniferous granites which are buried and blind, can't see them anymore, uh, but you've got the basin architecture which suggests that you may have a good chance of finding something along the lines of what's found in Kazakhstan, for example. Is phosphate one of those key ingredients that could become a, a pathfinder for you guys? Because I remember at one time when we had the boom in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, it went from uh, uranium boom to phosphate boom. Yeah. And the same guy at the same tenement. Now I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud here. Is yeah, you might be thinking, I think what it is is that... Um, Phosphates can have higher levels of uranium in them. So oh, okay. there is a, uh, what's the word, a technical potential to extract uranium from phosphates. And I believe that there's even some companies that develop their proprietary methods to do so. The trick is, of course, that the, the concentration levels are quite low. So it's like a sort of a low grade source of uranium yep. and chemically and technically complex, uh, you know, so not easy. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like, you know, uranium is in seawater. And, you know, the Japanese ran programs to prove that you could extract uranium from seawater and, and you know, technically successful. 
uh, but expensive. Commercially, commercially, yeah. <laughs> there may yeah. be a day, right, no, yeah. where, uh, you know, it, it, you can imagine a future time in hundreds of years' time yeah. where that becomes economic, you know, yeah. stripping uranium out of sea, seawater. So I wouldn't be surprised. Today, though, yes, it's not, it's not on the cards. And your other projects, I mean, I, I, my understanding is so you've got the paleo chain roll front, then you've got the unconformity uranium targets, which is the Northern Territory stuff that you do. Yeah. Can you just give us a layman's dis um, you know, commentary on that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a very different thing. You know how I said before about how you know, a lot of typical metal mines, you'll have a fluid that's introduced into a system, and that's, you know, it, it's, it, it, the, the fluid is high in whatever it is that you're interested in, and it gets the right physical and geochemical environment for it to drop out in a particular location. Well, an unconformity uranium deposit is essentially that. Now, the trick about unconformity, it would be fair to say that in the industry there is a little bit of disagreement or um, debate about whether or not the source of uranium in unconformity deposits are from the cover sequences, so in what they would call top-down sort of models of precipitation. And then perhaps the older school of thinking is that it's what they call bottom-up, where you've got fluids that have come from depth, introduced into the system from deeper parts in the Earth's surface, comes up, hits the unconformity, and that's the right physical environment for the uranium to precipitate. So I think the debate is still ongoing with that one. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, an unconformity deposit is really just shorthand for saying, because an unconformity, the uranium that can occur in those deposits doesn't necessarily mean it has to be right on the unconformity. It can be above the unconformity, it can be below the unconformity, or it can, it can go across the entire thing. So, um, you know, in our presentation and in our materials in the um, prospectus, you'll see that we have a, a cartoon of a deposit that was found not long ago by Cameco called Angulari up in the Alligators Rivers region. And that shows that, you know, the, the uranium deposit sort of starts below the unconformity becomes quite substantial at the unconformity surface itself and then continues into the cover sequences above it. Um, so the, the unconformity is like a geological marker for where this is occurring. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's become shorthand for saying, you know, encapsulating a lot of deposit types that, you know, may not necessarily be at the unconformity, if you will. So, but anyway, just got to be careful about that. But having said that, it, is at the end of the day, it's a hard rock uranium deposit of higher grade. It's one of the reasons why we're looking there. So you get, you know, very good deposit quality. You know, the Rangers, the Kungaras, the Jabalukas of the world, these are world-class deposits, right? And that's in the Alligator Rivers region of, of the Northern Territory. So we're, we're in there looking for, for new ones of those. And just going to that with that um, Mount Douglas project, Noel. So the main project we have granted in that area is called Mount Douglas. It's not in the Alligators Rivers region. It's in what's called the Pine Creek origin. So if you look at a geological map of Northern, Northern Territory, all the old rocks are sort of clustered around that sort of Northern third of the Northern Territory. And that's where all the uranium deposits have been found, or the majority of the uranium deposits have been found in clusters in that area. So whether it's you know, uh, in around Rum Jungle, or you've got the Coronation, Still, uh, Coronation Hill style deposits, in the southern part of the Pine Creek origin. Then you've got in the northeast, the Alligators Rivers region, which is the most famous part of it. Our project, Mount Douglas, was sort of the brainchild of one of our advisors, um, a guy called Jeff Upini. And Jeff's been involved in unconformity deposits for 50 plus years, right? He was there when Ranger was discovered and drilled out back in the early 70s. So he's seen his fair share of unconformity uranium deposits. He had this idea that the geology in the Alligators Rivers region was being reflected in this other part of the Pine Creek origin, just poorly recognised as such. There is, uh, in, our, in our project area, we have what's called the Combolgi sandstone, which is the cover sequence, and below that is the unconformity, and we've proved that that unconformity occurs out at our project area. So the, the depth of uh, erosion at Mount Douglas is deeper than at the, the Alligators Rivers region. So we're closer to the unconformity surface. So people who are exploring for uranium in, in the Alligators Rivers region are drilling through cover sequences to get to the good stuff. Whereas we are going to be looking or exploring the sequences much closer to the action. 
we're, we're either at or close to the unconformity surface at Mount Douglas. So it's a really exciting area because of that. Okay, okay. For those guys out there who have no idea what un unconformity is, I'll put a link somewhere and, and you guys can do your own research. <laughs> yeah, I could explain that really quickly in oh, a simplistic way. Yeah, yeah so look, an, an unconformity is a break in geological time. So you basically have a, 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 you know, rocks that are laid down over millions of years in a, in a sequence, right? And then something happens, usually something pretty major. You know, in geological terms, um, there might have been a lot of uplift and a lot of erosion or something else has happened which is, you know, change the geological environment in a really profound way and then you have a sequence of time which is sort of missing in the rock record and then and then things go back to normal and so more rocks are laid down and it goes you know sequentially but there's that gap and the geologists can see in the rock record record that there's a gap in geological time a bit like COVID. yes we had an unconformity <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We had, in a sense, an unconformity, yeah, right? Yeah. Lots of strange things happened in those yeah. couple of years, right? <laughs> so, yeah, geologically speaking, uh, you know, COVID. That's, yeah. <laughs> you like that? I like that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, let's take a step back to, to, to why we think uranium is the go. I mean, you would be full bottleness. So, maybe just give us a, a timeline thinking of why do you think um, uranium is going to be the main player moving forward or yeah. a, a play yeah a play i should say it's, it's going to be a significant yeah, uh, yeah that's right S significant significant commodity going forward see I, I think noel we're at the very start of a much more major move so you know the uranium price has gone from 25 dollars to about 50 so it's in like the last 12 to 18 months it's essentially doubled right mm. so that's its first phase and that's really just the beginning because, you know, you've gone from a situation where most producers are not making money to most producers are now at least making a small margin. But $50 is not enough to introduce new mines, right? So you're not going to have a lot of new production coming on with these sort of prices. And it would be fair to say that a lot of capacity in the industry has been lost in the last 10 years because it's, it's been in the doldrums, right, for 10 years plus. So... A lot of skills are lost, you know, the um, mines are mined out, you know, the industry has gone backwards essentially, and very soon there's going to be much more demand in the market. So why do I believe that? So fundamentally underpinning that is this, and in fact in our, um, uh, in our prospectus and in our presentation we make the point that the crux of the matter is that the world is trying to reduce CO2 emissions and many countries are pushing the renewable energy agenda. Renewable energy is backed up by batteries. But in a number of countries around the world, they're now pushing up against the physical limits of that and are now reverting back to nuclear to kind of underpin their systems. This will take a little while to play out, but my strong personal belief is that the penny will drop that the delivery of 100% renewables backed up by batteries is a bit of a pipe dream. Nothing wrong with renewable energies in the right niche, in the right application. In fact, South Australia would be a country which can probably push the envelope more than most when it comes to renewable energy because we've got great solar resources, great wind energy resources around our coastlines. So of all the nations of the world, we can probably hit it harder than, than most. But at the end of the day, we're going to need to have reliable energy, not just renewable energy. <laughs> and that's where I think the nuclear sort of turnaround is going to come about because you will see globally at the moment, electricity prices are jumping up really significantly. 50, 60% type jumps in a year, right? So that, 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 that's the market sending a signal to everyone, hey, everything's not normal, right? Something's not quite right here. So we're in the early phases of this adjustment. I wouldn't be surprised that in the next, say, next year or two, we see grid fragility in electricity grids around the world. And by grid fragility, I mean that we have small blackouts here and there that might only last a few hours, maybe a few days at most, because the electricity system hasn't got that robustness about it. And everyone's going to say, well, how do we, how do we get into this situation? Why is it so fragile, right? And then further down the track, it's going to be even worse 
I don't think we'll quite get to the even worse stage because I think we'll react before we get too bad. But the logic of it is that we will end up with electricity systems that are going to be incredibly unreliable. And we just don't have the metal intensity to be able to deliver a reliable electricity grid with renewable energy. You know, when Chris Bow and the, uh, the energy minister, federal energy minister, and climate change, you know, he'll say we're going to go for 100% renewable energies by backed up by batteries, right? Well, really, the key question at that point is, okay, that's what you're shooting for. What country has successfully delivered that model? And not even what country, what city has done it? And not even a, not even a city, what, what town, right? Where, anywhere globally, has that model been delivered at any scale? About the only scale I can think of where that has been delivered are small farms that are out in the middle of nowhere that are forced to do it because of their situation, right? So yeah, we're pushing up against those physical limits and the, the only logical, really significant energy source that can both decarbonise and be reliable is nuclear energy. Everything else has got CO2 emissions associated with it. Hydro can also do quite a bit, but of course hydro depends on where you are geographically. So it's geographically constrained, right? Mm -hmm. Nuclear can be rolled out in whatever uh, case. I mean, um, off camera, we had, a, uh, we had a discussion, me saying I was in some, a broker's office, we had a discussion about what, we just, what you've just described. Mm. And he said, look, you know, at, at some point in time, I mean, at that, at that time, the uranium was sort of a, a four-letter word. Mm. And he said, at, at a point in time, the, the re renewable energy uh, discussion is going to realise we're not going to make this thing happen as we wished. Yeah. And then the the discussion of nuclear comes in. Where do you think we are in that time frame that we talked about? Are we, I think we're sort of in that middle bit where it's just realization. turning now. Yeah, yeah. And you can see it with public opinion as well. I think you know the percentage of people in Australia which are becoming not necessarily super enthusiastic about nuclear, but pro enough to say, well, we're going to really need it, mm -hmm. right? And so well, I would call that the pragmatic support, right? May not be passionate in their hearts, but pragmatically speaking, they want to see a partnership between renewable energy and nuclear energy so we can decarbonise, right? Mm. And internationally, obviously, you know, we, we talk about mm. the real place and the people like us is at home and we are very commentary yeah. about things. So what is the real force saying, I mean, f from your point of view, what's the real force doing? sometimes we can't stop the real force whatever whatever our view point of view is yeah, yeah what is the real force doing so you're talking about those sort of events overseas which are really pushing things well along. yeah, and, yeah. And someone if everyone's going to nuclear then yeah you know no matter what your view is we're going to nuclear right yeah that's kind right and look you you're touching on an important point there not because the Australians do not we're not well informed in Australia about what's happening in the nuclear industry globally because we've got no nuclear industry of ourselves ourselves right so it's sort of completely off our radar mm. really and the media do not really cover a lot of significant moves in the uranium and nuclear industry you know cop 26 last year one of the most significant announcements in that cop was the Chinese nuclear build out you know the Chinese are building more reactors in the next 15 years than the whole world put together in the last 35 like enormous numbers right and it was not it, it got zero airplay here in Australia but it was by far the most significant announcement at COP26 the climate change conference right so it sort of plays very funnily out here and you know and obviously I'm familiar with what's going on internationally in the market one element I think which is going to surprise people is that there were a number of countries that were looking at shutting down their nuclear and there are a number of countries that were like well we've got nuclear energy we'll just We'll, we'll run the plants until they're finished and then we'll shut them when they've reached their end of life, right? So even in the last, I think it's something like the last, I think Cameco said the last 12 months, 22 reactors have either uh, been restarted instead of being shut down or their life has been extended beyond what they were originally going to do, right? Now we've got 438 odd reactors globally. So 22 or 438, that's a big number, 
which has shifted course in just the last 12 mm -hmm. months, right? So you're talking about what are the global forces at work? Well, there's an example of what's happening, which is a real physical reality in terms of the nuclear market. And we haven't even talked about new build yet, right? Mm. And the bit that is going to really surprise people, I think, is the speed at which the small modular reactor sector is now starting to gather pace. This is that ura uh, submarine size reactor well, that people talk about? Yeah, that, that's often how people think of them. Um, technically, well, officially, the International Atomic Energy Agency defines it as a reactor that's 300 megawatts or less, or might be 350. So, you know, a typical nuclear reactor might be one gigawatt, right? So it can be 300 or less, so, and it can be from a nuclear submarine through to a, just a scaled down, you know, pressurized water reactor of some sort, um, depending on what type you're talking about. So this is the problem. When you talk small modular reactors, it, it's actually a wide range of different types. It could be scaled down current technology, right? So Rolls-Royce in the UK are doing that. They're basically building a smaller version of what we build everywhere. When you say smaller, are we talking about footprint small? Yes, footprint yeah, small. Footprint smaller, but yeah, it's smaller in the sense that it's it's producing less, less output yeah, yeah, at yeah. the end of the day. So yes, it's scaled down. Okay, okay. And they're trying to do it in such a way so that the components of the scaled down unit can be produced in a factory and taken to site and put together like Lego, okay, right? Okay. Whereas when you build a big one 1.4 gigawatt nuclear plant, you've got a lot of bespoke pieces of equipment. It's difficult to bring them in. You know, construction's complex, right? With those sort of types of units. So Rolls-Royce and other operators, they're trying a different approach to make it quicker. Now, they're, they're shooting for first commissioning of their first plant in the UK in 2029. There's a, uh, another US provider that's looking at 2028 for the first one. So that's, it. that's the end of this decade. Not, you know, here we are about to go into 2023. 2028 doesn't seem that far away to me, right? No, and, and you know, especially I, at our age. Yeah, that's right. And and I, and I think you know, I'm not suggesting there's going to be hundreds of small modular reactors in 2028, 2029. That's just the start of a of a yeah. of a larger movement, yeah, where I yeah. think people are going to be moving towards that. Yeah, I mean, for the guys who, I mean, the, for people who say, look, you know, I, nuclear is very bad because of all the past history and things like that. How has that moved? now since you know 10 20 years ago the the percent well the chance of, of something bad happening a reactor yeah. where are we at in that discussion yeah look i think that the those perceptions and weighing up the risks is changing with time so the, the thing to remember about nuclear is that it's you know it's an evolving thing the technology is getting better and better so after each incident a lot of that stuff is being engineered out right so the chances of it occurring again, are almost zero because it's been engineered out. Lessons have been learned and reactors are better designed and, you know, the, the number of incidents are getting smaller and smaller and the amount of people being impacted is getting lower and lower, right? Take Fukushima, for example. You know, it, it surprises people when you say to them, well, actually, no one died in the Fukushima incident as a direct result of that accident, right? There was a there was a tsunami that killed something like 17,000 people, but at the nuclear site, there was no deaths attributable directly to what happened at that nuclear site. So, sure, it was a, an event where they'd lost control of the situation with the cooling of the spent fuel. So it's not a situation you want to have happen again, um, but it wasn't also the end of the world either. And I think to some extent, the Japanese is now starting to click to that. And so they're looking at restarting their reactors over the course of the next couple of years. So okay. perceptions have changed even there. It's true that we tend to overreact with nuclear. So when something happens, you know, it, it, it just fires off, you know, everyone's brain starts exploding and people react, you know. Um, you know, take, for example, in um, uh, the Ukraine war. Do you remember when, they, when the, the, the armed forces were approaching the nuclear plants yeah. and people were saying, oh, it's going to be the end of the world? Yeah. And, and then what happens? Nothing, yeah. right? And everyone carries on. But no one goes back to say, oh, we were wrong, right? Nothing actually bad happened, right? I think in some ways um, that, that is a good indication of how people think, that there is a conscious understanding of let's 
this is very dangerous stuff. Let's be careful because I think, in, and in that sense, we're, what I'm trying to say is there's probably more thought into making sure a reactor doesn't go bad than what we're going to do with that great big windmill if it blows up. That that safety precaution, I think, there's lesser degree. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If something happens with those big windmills, I mean, it's a big windmill. If it can blow up, it has blown up, yeah. and it can dr break winds. You yeah, know, all sorts right. of stuff, you know? Yeah, on a, on a per unit of energy delivered, nuclear has one of the lowest fatality rates of any, any energy source. Yeah. So, as human beings, we go about our business, we do all sorts of things out there, you know, which have got risk associated with them, and bad things can happen. We have access. That's what happens in, you know, human life. And so what it's about is being, uh, weighing up the fact that you can manage the risk appropriately, for the benefit that you're achieving, yeah. right? That's why people still fly in airplanes, right? Yeah. <laughs> because if you were like zero risk sort of person, you'd never, well, you'd never get out of your house, would you, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't walk the across car. the road. That's right. So we always weigh these things up. Yeah. And I think what's happening is there's a recalibration of the risk versus reward yeah. for the whole nuclear thing, given the situation where energy is now short. Yeah. That's why we've got energy crises globally. And everyone's going, well, we need energy. And it's a fundamental part of our society. We can take on a bit of risk for that. And in nuclear, funnily enough, the risks are very manageable. Right? Well, for us, but not for the guy who's anti-nuclear. But well, no, that's well, that's right. But that, there might be nothing you can do about that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they've got a very different thing going on with their weighing of risk. Yeah, it's, it's an understanding and an acceptance of where things should be and how it is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, in terms of um, of use in what you guys are going, maybe yeah. we give us a, a, a roundup of how things are going. Um, and um, I think you're closing in next yeah. Friday. Yeah, so we're closing on Friday the 25th of November. So in roughly speaking, a bit over a week's time. Uh, yet we're, we, we're doing very well with the raising. So, you know, the broker firm offers very well, well filled and... I'm here in Perth pitching at the moment, so we're getting some more names involved. Being well received, actually. And it's one of those, one of those interesting ones, Noel, in that um, the uh, pitching to the institutional investors, getting a very, very good reception. And I think it's because they've taken a sophisticated view of what's happening with the energy market globally, and they can see where this is all going, right? Perhaps less so with retail land, I would say, right? I don't think the penny's quite dropped with retail, but in terms of institutional uh, 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 backing, it's been excellent. Okay, well look, you know, um, I know you're a busy man, you need to rush off, and um, yep. any last words from you before we close up? Oh, look, I, I, th I think it's an exciting sector, and you like, what I would say is that, you know, we've, we've, um, we're in the early stages of a reinvigorization of, of uranium and uranium exploration, and Orpheus is planning to put itself in, in a position of being a really good go-to name for the right team, we've got excellent people involved, first-class projects, and we're, and, we're, and a very modest EV, so we're not overblown in terms of value. So as a kind of an entrant into getting exposure to uranium and the whole nuclear power thesis, if you will, we're not a bad place to start. Oh, and one more thing, Noel, something that I wanted to uh, highlight about the company that I think is really important is some of the people that are involved, and we've got some first-class technical consultants that are helping me putting the whole package together. So uh, um, we've got Jeff Yupini, who's a 50-year-plus experienced geologist. For, you know, probably no one better at looking at unconformity uranium in the Northern Territory. Goes back all the way to the days of Ranger uranium mine discovery, etc. Um, we've got another guy called Dr. David Rawlings, um, sort of nicknamed Rowdy, as he's known in the field. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Rawlings is a uh, ex chemico geologist, worked with Toro Energy with me back in the day, um, excellent uranium geologist, and he's assisting me with a lot of the project generation work. So, we've got a significant project generation exercise in the company where we're going to be building new, new projects that are going to come in. Uh, on the board, we've got a guy called Darryl, uh, Dr. Daryl Clark, and Daryl is again ex chemico, he was EVP of exploration for chemico. Uh, was CEO of the Inkai joint venture. You know, I was talking before about the the Institute of Recovery deposits in Kazakhstan. Well, he's worked on one, right? So um, very, very good experience with the Institute of Recovery. 
Um, we've got um, uh, Pat Elliott on the board, uh, who's our chairman. He's also the chairman of, of our parent company, Argonaut Resources. And lastly, Simon O'Loughlin, who's an uh, uh, Adelaide-based lawyer, been involved in a lot of junior companies um, uh, with the Taylors, Taylor Collisons, which uh, is our broker. So, you know, four out of those six people have got very deep uranium exploration, exploration experience. So we think we're, we're well set up as a, as a small company. Okay, fantastic. Look, um, yeah, I mean, I know you've got another meeting to hit off too, but look, um, fantastic story. I think it's a good lesson in uranium, and I think that's what we're trying to do is get you guys in to share your wisdom. Um, and one of them is uh, with Florence Drummond, who is the founder of Indigenous Women in Mining Resource Australia. She and I have been working together, giving our guests coffee to go away with. Oh. And here is um, one that another sort of de uh, development that she's done. It's called Kick. It is actually a, a, a group of um, sort of di diversive in indigenous um, businesses, yep. which uh, supports our industry in terms of all sorts of, I'll have all these links in, in the blog. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, and enjoy the coffee. Uh, unfortunately, it's beans this time, so you've got to crush it before you- That's okay, I can do that at home. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Okay, and um, look, Simon, thank you. It's a great story. I think um, I do feel that uranium has to play soon. And as, as, as often you guys go out there and uh, do your own research, contact uh, Simon. Uh, I'm pretty sure by the time we all get this out, we'll be, you need, you know, have maybe a couple of days left to get in there yep. if you're into it. But again, Simon, thank you. And Thanks very uh, much all for the best. Me. Thanks very much for having me. All right. Excellent. Thank you.